During daylight hours, most of us have very little trouble in orientating ourselves, in recognising objects, judging distances, in fact, seeing a total scene. This is the same crossing at night. When it's dark, the various parts of the scene become unconnected. The background has disappeared and there's very little that you can recognise. Certainly there are luminous points of various sorts coming from the traffic, but in between those points it's dark and therefore appears to be empty. So in contrast to daylight hours, it's difficult to see an overall scene. The problem of making sense out of this confusion becomes more obvious if you look at a starry sky on a clear night. The so-called configurations, or the shapes we think we see in the night sky, are all images that we have to learn. These images only develop their shape when the different luminous points are connected by lines. Here, for example, you might describe these stars as a bicycle because there are luminous points in the same relationship as a bicycle equipped with reflectors in the same pattern. But in the dark, you simply wouldn't be able to recognise it as a bicycle. It seems to do nothing more than create what you might possibly describe as a violent visual racket. For a very long time, we've been accustomed to using visual codes during daylight to recognise different things. Bright red for fire engines is a typical example. Blue rotating lights. White ambulances. Yellow trams and traffic lights, all different codes which convey an accepted meaning. At night, too, there have developed some visual codes. For instance, up until now, railways have made use of a code of coloured lights. Now, this is quite possible for railways because they run their traffic at a given time to a given place. They have a tight schedule, and a train running on rails can't do anything else but travel on a direct route. The green starboard light on a ship is a code which tells you that the ship is sailing from left to right. The red port light on the other side tells you that the ship is sailing in the opposite direction. This code also works very well on a confined waterway. But when it comes to road traffic, although originally some of the principles of the railways were incorporated, it's obvious that that form of code simply cannot survive unchanged with the intensity of present day traffic. Seen from a moving vehicle, there are a lot more objects on the road to take in. Other traffic, signals, markings of various kinds and signs, changing all the time from one place and one situation to another. Public lighting does try to provide a substitute for daylight. It tries to provide the overall image which comes during the day, but of course it can't achieve it. For the human eye, though not so much to the camera, the road is partially lit. What you can't see is the background. Certainly when there is public lighting, it's possible to see which way the road goes. The lampposts may form a line of safety beacons, but little more. It's important not to give the individual lamps too much luminous intensity, otherwise the road user can easily become dazzled. It's much more effective to use lamps with a larger luminous surface area and only a moderate luminosity. For example, these are now being used in traffic signs and signposts, and they provide many more opportunities for different shapes than you can ever get from a pattern made out of luminous points. To the human eye, large areas of light with low luminance are much more effective, as with the sides of this Dutch tunnel. Although it isn't easy to prove it with a film camera, you can see the principle, and indeed these lights are often quoted as an example by experts. Nevertheless, the old railway system is still being used in the vast majority of cases for road traffic. Advertisers have realised dramatically that large luminous areas are much more recognisable. So, we can conclude that the old system is out of date and we have to think of alternatives, particularly when it comes to two-wheelers, which are the most vulnerable group of vehicles. But a solution can only be of value if the entire traffic scene at night is altered in the same way. 
There's no doubt that two-wheelers are vulnerable, particularly at night, because they're not sufficiently recognisable. Did you realise that that was a bicycle? This solution of spoke reflectors isn't too bad at first sight, but as part of a complicated traffic scene, it isn't enough. Reflectors in the wheels produce rather confusing images, and as a way of recognising a bicycle, they're either insufficient or they fail altogether. Because they create a muddle of individual luminous points in an already confused background, they only make the visual racket worse than before. There are other solutions worth considering, providing that they aim at a stable, recognisable shape. An obvious connected pattern of non-blinding luminous points. The question is, which solution is the best? Based on several investigations, it seems that the most reliable way of recognising a two-wheeler at night is reflective tyres. The two reflecting circles provide the best answer because they immediately and obviously represent a two-wheeler. From this research, it's possible to see which way we should aim to alter the formula for night traffic illumination. But of course, even for the vulnerable two-wheeler, these reflective tyres are not the whole answer. Obviously, you can't always see the side of a bicycle when it's travelling along the road. The front and the back of a bicycle are just as important, not only as far as simple visibility is concerned, but also when it comes to recognising a two-wheeler for what it is. The basic lighting system of a pedal cycle is simply insufficient and very hard to improve. If a cyclist rides against the wind or struggles uphill, he goes so slowly that the output of his dynamo isn't nearly powerful enough. If he goes faster, his lights become more intense. His rear light also changes in intensity, which is why the red right-angled reflector was introduced in the Netherlands. Incidentally, because of its large surface, this also helps to make the bicycle recognisable for what it is. In West Germany, these reflectors are also being used more and more. The old Dutch tradition of having a reflecting surface on the rear mudguard is also effective with its bright vertical strip. As we said, the dynamo on a cycle doesn't always produce enough luminous intensity, and so the front probably needs a different solution. A white reflector, for instance. In this way, it's perfectly possible to introduce a recognisable code for each individual type of vehicle. Any such code would have to link with the already existing traditions of form, like the accepted face of a car with its symmetrically placed headlights. Which configurations would lead to the most immediate and exact recognition would have to come from tests and research. Already, lighting installations on mopeds differ from one type to another. What is needed is some visual recognition which will distinguish one kind of moped from another when they behave in different ways. In countries where mopeds have their own rules of behaviour, it's necessary for them to distinguish themselves recognisably. Recognise a vehicle and its behaviour becomes more predictable. This might be one solution, a white square reflector. The larger motorcycle also deserves very special attention. A motorbike can easily be mistaken for either a bicycle or a moped despite its very much higher speed. It might even be taken for a car with one broken headlight. If the motorbike doesn't have an immediately recognisable and different face from a car, confusion between motorbikes and cars is bound to happen. Providing the motorbike with its own face is one of the problems under investigation at the moment. Uh, for instance, a three-point pattern with reflectors on the back of the mirrors or small lamps set at the same height as the mirrors. Unlike luminous points, larger areas with more moderate luminosity have the advantage of producing a recognisable shape. Still, we mustn't discount the use of luminous points with their extra luminosity, particularly when it comes to detection in the periphery of the visual field. This is why a minimum number of strong luminous points are often needed Sets of more than three luminous points may provide less information than shapes, but configurations can be useful, provided they are made simple enough. 
Delineations like these are obvious and functional when they use this very clear reflecting material. Still, sets of more than three luminous points can also be useful because they are converted by the eye into a single line. Sometimes luminous points which follow a pattern of typical rhythmical movements can be very recognizable, which is why yellow reflectors on pedals are compulsory for cyclists in Holland. So, what at the moment seems to be an ever-increasing visual chaos at night on the roads can be dealt with. If measures are taken based on the kind of research you've been looking at, it is possible to produce a clear and organized traffic scene in the dark. <laughs>